Good day, dear friends. Today, my colleague and I will discuss the causes and treatments for shoulder osteoarthritis. Interestingly, shoulder osteoarthritis encompasses several conditions. By the way, the term shoulder osteoarthritis as a diagnosis no longer officially exists, although it is still commonly used. Currently, medical professionals focus on the specific components that make up shoulder osteoarthritis. These include tendinitis, tendinosis, wear and tear of the long head of the biceps tendon, arthritis of the acromioclavicular joint, a small joint between the acromial process of the scapula and the collarbone, arthritis of the sternoclavicular joint, bursitis, synovitis, inflammation of the synovial membrane, inflammation of the joint capsule, and various types of adhesions in the muscles and capsule. Shoulder osteoarthritis, or scapulohumeral periarthritis, as it's more broadly known, typically presents with restricted movement and pain. Initially, movement restriction is noticed when trying to move the arm backward, with one side usually worse than the other. Over time, this progresses to difficulty raising the arm, where the shoulder and arm lift together as a single unit. Why does this happen? There is a small bony prominence on the upper part of the shoulder bone, and above it, on the scapula, is the acromion process. The scapula has a specific bony process, but in this case, it's not quite as it should be, correct? Here's how it normally functions. In a healthy shoulder, this bony prominence slides smoothly under the acromion during movement. But with scapulohumeral periarthritis, this mechanism is disrupted. The prominence gets stuck or bent and the shoulder does not move as it should, requiring the entire shoulder blade to lift with the arm. This disruption occurs because the correct sequence of muscle contractions in the joint is impaired. Raising the arm is primarily the job of the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle has three parts. The middle bundle extends from the area of the acromioclavicular joint in this direction. The anterior and posterior bundles. The middle bundle originates near the acromioclavicular joint, while the anterior and posterior bundles attach from the front and back. These three bundles converge at a point on the shoulder bone and contract to lift the arm. When the deltoid muscle contracts, it raises the arm upward. But if this contraction occurs in isolation, it specifically causes the shoulder bone to lift upward. And this hump will become engaged in the movement. For the shoulder to function properly, two muscles located in front of the deltoid must also contract in coordination. The subscapularis muscle is located here, woven into the joint capsule. It occupies the entire area beneath the scapula, extending along its axis. The infraspinatus muscle, its antagonist, originates from the inside of the scapula, sitting just below it, and attaches to the other side of the shoulder joint. These muscles are part of the rotator cuff, responsible for rotating the shoulder joint. They enable inward and outward rotation of the arm. The first symptom of impaired shoulder function is difficulty raising the arm behind the back, such as placing the hand behind the body. This indicates dysfunction in either the subscapularis or infraspinatus muscle. Most often, the subscapularis muscle is affected due to several potential causes that can disrupt its function. The infraspinatus muscle typically does not weaken, 
instead, it tends to shorten. Therefore, this specific impairment affects the movement, namely inward rotation, which is carried out by the infraspinatus muscle. Upward movement of the shoulder is governed by the subscapularis muscle, while other muscles such as the teres major and teres minor are also involved in shoulder movement, they generally do not cause the same degree of issues as the subscapularis and infraspinatus. Another common reason for difficulty lifting the arm is compression of the supraspinatus tendon. The supraspinatus muscle occupies the upper portion of the scapula, hence its name. Compression of the supraspinatus tendon occurs in this area and is often linked to instability in the acromioclavicular joint. When does this happen? It typically begins with instability in the joint. Do you see this joint? Most often, it all begins there. This joint is often the root cause of problems requiring compensatory movements, such as lifting the arm in an unusual way. Dislocation of this joint or a sensation of tightness over the trapezius muscle can occur. Initially, issues may manifest as inflammation, tendinitis, or tendinosis. The tendons begin to degenerate. Why does instability arise? It usually starts with some form of injury. For example, the joint may sustain damage that doesn't heal properly. This accounts for 50% of cases. Instability may also stem from the collarbone, scapula, or the muscles that stabilize these two bones at the joint. Where does instability of the collarbone come from? It often stems from weakness in the subclavian muscle, which lies between the first rib and the collarbone. When this muscle is weak, the pectoral muscle becomes less effective. The head may tilt or rotate poorly. For example, if the issue is on the right side, turning the head to the right will be more difficult. Instead of the pectoral muscles assisting with head movement, the scalene muscles take over, compensating for the weakness. The first issue is collarbone instability. The second is instability of the scapula. What causes scapular instability? What provides stabilization for the scapula? The serratus anterior muscle plays a key role in stabilizing the scapula. This large muscle originates from the first to the ninth rib and extends under the scapula, anchoring it to the thoracic wall. It not only stabilizes the scapula, but also aids in rib movement during breathing. Stand in front of a mirror, take a deep breath in and out, and observe which side of your rib cage does not move. If there's reduced movement on one side, it indicates weakness in the serratus anterior on that side. This weakness might affect individual sections of the muscle, limiting rib mobility and causing the ribs to become fixed laterally in the joints. So the first issue is instability of the collarbone due to muscle weakness. The second issue is instability of the scapula caused by weakness in the serratus anterior muscle. Finally, Instability in the shoulder joint can result from an imbalance in the strength of the anterior and posterior portions of the deltoid muscle. Most often, it's the posterior deltoid that weakens. In some cases, both the anterior deltoid weakens and the joint becomes destabilized. Disruptions frequently occur in the tendons of the long head of the biceps, which are located within this groove. When the muscles responsible for stabilizing the scapula, such as the rhomboid muscle and the middle and lower trapezius, are weakened, the scapula shifts laterally. This lateral shift causes the shoulder to rotate abnormally. As a result, the humeral head rotates and the tendon of the long head of the biceps can slip out of its groove. Instead of remaining in the groove where it should glide freely, 
the tendon becomes displaced, leading to further instability. This displacement can cause tendon damage, including tendonitis and tendinosis, and eventually disrupts the joint capsule. Adhesive capsulitis, commonly known as frozen shoulder, can develop, further restricting shoulder movement. Additionally, the pectoralis minor muscle, which attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula, often becomes shortened. When this muscle shortens, it alters the position of the scapula, causing further misalignment. This misalignment can also impact the hip joint and restrict movement in the third, fourth, and fifth ribs, where the pectoralis minor is attached. Why does all of this happen? As we've discussed, various muscles, joints, and structures are involved in the progression of scapulohumeral periarthritis. Why does all of this happen? How can this condition be treated? Which methods are most effective? When should non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs be used? And are they effective? Can topical ointments help? What exercises are beneficial and which should be avoided? Some exercises may even worsen joint issues, potentially leading to arthritis in the shoulder joint itself. What causes rapid atrophy of the deltoid muscle? And what are the common mistakes, such as improper training or incorrect exercises, that can lead a healthy person to develop scapulohumeral periarthritis? We will explore these questions next time.